So the first session um, is going to explore the many ways that invasive species impact Australia. Uh, it, it could be impact on species, it could be impact on, on ecosystems, agriculture, biosecurity, economic, social. It, there's a whole lot of impacts and we're going to co cover that gamut. Um, they're going to paint a picture, the speakers, the five speakers will paint a picture from their perspective, and each one will tell you what their perspective is, of, of what that impact is. What I might do is just go straight to our first speaker. Uh, and that's Andrew, Andrew Cox. And Andrew Cox is the CEO of the Invasive Species Council. So, Andrew, I'll get you to come up and I'll pass you the controller if you need it. No, I won't need it. Thanks, Anthony. Look, it's uh, great to be here. Um, I want to honour the traditional owners and I want to also note the land we're on, but also note the plants and animals are here before uh, Melbourne was here and welcome any Indigenous people here today. I'm Andrew Cox, I'm the CEO of the Invasive Species Council. The Invasive Species Council is interested in lowering the impacts of invasive species, stopping invasive species extinctions, and um, we're a national group. We're be probably better known for our advocacy, but we also do deep analysis, uh, we form alliances, and we also do some on-ground action, whether it's our own research, whether it's treating yellow crazy ants in Townsville. So we do a bit of everything, but we're here to serve people like you to lower the impact on the environment for invasive species. So let me thank the uh, Royal Society of Victoria for hosting this event. I think it's really important that you do things like this. I think um, you're, you're a, an agent for change using the scientists to um, bring about the change we want. And uh, not only are we proud to be a, a co-host of this uh, event. We also have the privilege to ha have our AGMs in this building every, every year when, we, when we're meeting face-to-face, -face, so we've been doing that for quite a few years, and thanks to the generosity of the RSV for, for that. So I guess my, my role in this little session I've got is really to, I guess, set the scene a bit, but to really remind us of the importance of biocontrols for vertebrate pest control. Um, you know, biocontrol's a bit of our get out of jail card. We've got all of these pests that have arrived in Australia, whether through deliberate action of acclimatisation societies or people who like exotic pets, um, or accidental introductions as hitchhikers, etc. But those um, animals that have spread across the country and causing all those impacts. Often the biocontrols are the only solution for the relentless impacts and the relentless control people on the ground must do. And Australia has been a leader of biocontrols, at least the traditional ones, and um, obviously we all know the Khaleesi virus success in 1925, so it's a long time ago, it's getting, all, you know, it's getting on 100 years ago. Um, we all know about the biocontrol failure with the cane toad in 1934. Hopefully, well, I know we have, have learned on that. that was, that's a bio, they're biocontrols for plants. But the, the, the big standout one, of course, for, for vertebrate pests is, is the rabbit and the Khaleesi virus introduction in 1950. So again, a long time ago, and we've learned a lot since then. <clears throat> so traditional biocontrols are important, but over time, they're going to get harder and harder. We know we've got to keep updating the strains, we've got to, um, there's only so many things that we can, you know, we've often found the easiest solutions and the solutions now in the future get harder and harder. So that's why these new generation biocontrols, the, the uh, smart, you know, whether we were talking about gene editing and whatever else we, uh, the scientists can present with us, are going to be so important because we need to be keep updating our tool, toolbox. We need to keep trying to find smart ways to save animals and plants from extinction and from losing these things we love and for protecting our livelihoods. Obviously, you know, it's not just about the environment. There's so many aspects that uh, pest animals uh, change our environment and lose some of these things that we value in, in Australia. And um, I think you all know this, but it's probably worth restating about research and development and, and almost any science, it takes time. 
it takes time and it's difficult. And it's sort of, it's not just the applied science and research that's important, it's also the pure research, because often you build on the foundations of some really important um, pure science um, and breakthroughs to do your applied science. It takes time and we need an innovative environment and that isn't always the case. Um, we need to take risks. We need to accept failure sometimes. We need to be brave. We need determination and the people who do this work, they're not driven by money, they're driven by a desire to do good but over many, many years. So you need that long-term commitment. So I think that's really important um, to really think about, um, not just what is the science doing, but how do we support that, that science to do, it, do its work. So as, um, as Anthony mentioned, we've got three sessions here. We're talking about the why, why, why are we here and why is this so important? And that's hopefully pretty straightforward. Um, the how, and we're gonna hear some really exciting examples of some great uh, leading, leading research that's happening. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about some of the technical constraints, some of the ethics and the social license we need to be keeping doing this work. So with the, the remaining few minutes, I'm going to just talk a bit about the oper operating environment that this work needs to, to succeed. We need institutions to do this work. And institutions like CSIRO, we all know, institutions like the Center for Invasive Species Solutions who are also a, a, a co-sponsor of this event, the National Environment Science Program, universities, all of the universities um, have a role to play here. And the, the other important agencies are things like uh, you know, the, the federal agencies, the state agencies, and I, I, of course we've got to mention the state research bodies, there's the, the Arthur Riley Institute, and um, often these agencies who are doing this work are often very agricultural centric, uh, because that's where some of the research is. Sometimes the environment um, does this, but for many pest problems which straddle both environment and agriculture, sometimes the emphasis is too much on agriculture and the environment gets behind, left behind and sometimes vice versa. So that's a really important, again, enabling environment for this if through the institutional areas. <clears throat> you also need good plans. You need a, a policy framework within government. At the federal level, there's two very important ones, one called Nick Birdies, which is the National Environmental um, and Community uh, research and development extension strategy. I think I've got it right, have I, Shalom? It's a pretty horrible acronym, but um, this R&D strategy for environmental biosecurity um, is, is, sets out the priorities and hopefully drives funding, but unfortunately it's not at the moment. There's also a pest animal strategy, so at the federal level that's a really important one. Um, I should just quick, I'm going to just speed up a bit because I think we'll want to cover all of the um, enabling environments. Um, Obviously, uh, at the state level, there's some really important work happening in Victoria now around its new biosecurity framework. We also need a, a regulatory environment that supports this. And I'm sure people pull their hair out at occupational health and safety. For good reason we need it, but it could be a barrier. We've got approvals processes, we've got ethics, and you know, some important work we did about 1080. I mean, talk about an ethical quandary. Um, it's, it's, we need that enabling environment, and I have to mention animal welfare. And finally, funding. We're probably not going to talk much about funding. I'm going to talk about funding, because if you don't have the funding long term, you don't have funding like this, you need funding like this. And we don't really have it in Australia, and that's so, so important. So finally, I'll just uh, mention two things. This decade of biosecurity card on your chair, this is a collaboration to strengthen biosecurity and hopefully the benefit will be more funding and policy support for more research and development in pest control. And finally, the Invasive Species Council. We are your advocacy partner. We want to make you su succeed. Uh, we want to create the oper operating environment for you to do your work. So um, I'd love to work with every one of you and um, I wish you all the success. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you on many levels. One for modelling fitting to time, which is wonderful.
Our second speaker in the morning session about defining the problem is Professor Ewan Ritchie. And Ewan is a, the, a prof the professor in wildlife ecology and conservation at Deakin University. And I'll let Ewan tell you what he's going to talk to you about. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you to the organisers of this day. It's wonderful to see us discussing this very complex um, and quite often emotive topic. So I'd also just like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, in the spirit of reconciliation um, and uh, all, all those people attending today, and of course those people might be attending online, and of course acknowledging that these are unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. So how big is the problem? Uh, the short answer is it's massive. Okay, so this is a piece of research that was recently published by Corey Bradshaw and colleagues, just putting a dollar value essentially on the impact of invasive species. And that includes plants and animals. And you can see since the 1960s, it's estimated to cost at least about $390 billion in terms of the amount of money that's been spent on trying to address uh, invasive species and or the incurred losses from invasive species. So it's a massive number. And among the most, um, I guess, uh, the species that cost us the most, if you like, um, cats and rabbits are in the top three. So bear that in mind, given that we're talking about vertebrates today. And work out of NESP uh, and Steve Carney and colleagues actually calculated, if we look at, I guess, a biodiversity impact in terms of what are the worst uh, species, um, and ranked them in terms of numbers of species affected, uh, as you can see, the rabbit actually comes out at number one, which might be a surprise to some people because you often hear a lot of discussion about feral cats, red foxes, and rightly so. Uh, but often I think the rabbit is not on the radar of a lot of people. And this is because largely, if you look at Australia's threatened species list, it comprises over 1,000 threatened species of plants, which a lot of people, again, are unaware of. So we have a lot of issues with uh, you know, our mammals, our birds, our reptiles, our frogs and so forth that are heavily impacted but we often forget about the plants. And so that's a really important thing to remember as well. So what are some of these impacts and just what is the scale of these impacts? And so this is some work that was led um, by Alison Stobo Wilson and colleagues, including myself, looking at the impact of red foxes and feral cats across the continent. And I won't read it out because you can read that yourself, but you can see the numbers we're talking about. You know, tens or hundreds of millions of animals being consumed, predated on by feral cats and foxes. And that, of course, has a really big impact in some cases on those species populations. And, of course, we have many threatened species, endangered species, and that therefore makes their existence precarious. Um, and that is, if, even if we look at in northern Australia, as an example, with species like the white uh, white rub, uh, rub, rash to rub rat, sorry, I'm getting myself confused. Um, and interestingly up there, I'm not talking necessarily just about uh, invasive predators like feral cats, but also large herbivores, and I'll get to that in a second. So things like buffalo, feral horses, donkeys, and so forth, they themselves also have a really impact, a big impact on species because they change habitat. And I think that's another really important thing that the pathways to impact on species is not just through things like predation, but it's also through things like disease, through habitat, and they compound the impacts. And it stresses the importance of interactions, which I'm gonna dwell on um, in this presentation. And of course, fire is prominent for many of us, given the devastation that we saw in 2019-20 across much of Australia, and that actually exacerbated the impact of invasive species, including the feral cat, on populations of endangered and threatened species. And as I said, large herbivores themselves are a really big part of the problem. Uh, of course, many of us are fully aware of the impact and issues related to feral horses uh, in much of southeastern Australia, and particularly in the alpine zones, which have particularly um, vulnerable and delicate ecosystems that can be heavily impacted by horses where they're present. Um, and this was a large review paper looking at the impacts of feral horses led by Don Driscoll and colleagues, um, and looking at a range of species as well as uh, habitat, uh, vegetation communities and so forth. So as an example, if you're a broadtooth rat and you have heavy grazing of your habitat, that means that you actually have less protection um, over the winter because your tunnels that you would normally construct out of grass um, are non-existent essentially. And also, of course, again, you're more exposed to predators. Okay, so there's less places to hide, there's less habitat available to you. So again, stressing those linkages, it's not just a single species approach and that's something I'm gonna sort of dwell on and reiterate throughout this presentation. It would be remiss of me, of course, to say <laughs> that there are also invasive vertebrates in aquatic habitats as well, uh, which I am not an expert on, but I just want to acknowledge that you know, fish, as an example, are a really big part of the problem. Carp, of course, got a lot of attention um, for good and bad reasons. 
Um, but even in northern Australia, as an example, species like tilapia, and I used to live in Townsville, and if you go in Townsville and put a dip net in a, in a river, it's like going to an aquarium. There is, there's all manner of um, invasive species in those rivers that people have basically released um, into those systems because they don't want them anymore, and it's a big problem. And I should also mention that, you know, I'm talking about wildlife in general, but invasive species can impact us. And some of us, in fact, in the room right now, quite possibly have infection with toxoplasmosis. Okay? It's widespread, it's carried by cats, and it's been shown to have some really quite dramatic impacts on people, including um, abortion, so uh, you know, termination of pregnancy. It also can potentially change people's behaviour, including risk-taking behaviour. So it's been associated with a whole range of really severe impacts on people. So again, we shouldn't be um, thinking just about wildlife, of course, but it can have really quite devastating impacts on people themselves. So is there really a worst invasive species and are invasive species the greatest threat to native biodiversity? Um, I would answer no to the first question, but it depends. Because what I really want to stress here is that I think isolating one particular species and saying this is Australia's worst invasive species is really kind of missing the point, that they interact with other species. So foxes interact with cats, they interact with rabbits, they interact with vegetation communities and the species that depend on those communities. So really focusing on a single species, I don't think in some cases does us a lot of favours. We should be really looking at ecosystems and the linkages within those. And likewise, you often hear people say invasive species are the biggest threat to biodiversity in Australia. And I don't actually um, subscribe to that. I say that habitat change in conjunction with invasive species and climate change and so forth is actually the risk. Because again, you can't separate them. They actually compound each other. And so to sort of isolate them and try and say this is the worst one, I think again is particularly unhelpful. Species operate in ecosystems, like I said. So here's a really simple, uh, basically, um, characterization, if you like, of a, of a food web and interactions within an arid system community uh, led by Tom Newsom. Um, you can see we've got dingoes at the top here interacting with feral cats and foxes. They also interact with herbivores like kangaroos and emus, and they in turn interact with smaller species, also other processes, really important processes like fire, of course weather, and the, the, the growth of vegetation communities. So again, if you basically um, tinker with one of these linkages and don't understand the implications of that, you can have some really bad outcomes. And we see that time and time and time again in invasive species management. And not, of course, without, you know, people have good intentions and people are working hard to try and get good outcomes, but we really need to stress the importance of that. And we have examples of this, you know, where we've controlled foxes, that leads to increased wallaby abundance and then reduced vegetation, again, impacting other species in the system. And you can see here the number of swamp wallabies increasing through time as a result largely of fox control. So you can address one problem and buy yourself another problem. And that's a really, uh, you know, a big issue uh, and why we need integrated approaches. So it's not rock science. It's much harder than that. Okay, mm -hmm. much harder than that. And... This is just an example of a modelling exercise that we did looking at if you control dingoes, what might be the knock-on impacts of feral cats and foxes and other linkages in that system. And you don't need to take anything away from this other than the fact that you can see this massive uncertainty here. So over the course of four years, we have this huge uncertainty in the range of um, outcomes in terms of the abundance of those species. Will it go up? Will it go down? We don't really actually know in almost all cases. There's a huge range of possible outcomes because we just don't have the right information to be able to determine what the outcomes would be. So uncertainty is a real challenge. Unexpected outcomes, we have um, control of foxes leading to actual increases of cat numbers in baited areas for foxes leading to declines in woilies. At, you know, species that we care about and are trying to increase their populations. So we need to manage communities and ecosystems. And that, that involves processes. So rather than focusing on the species, let's look at the impact of fire, how that changes habitat, and then how that might benefit small mammals. Okay, and we can see here, further work down here showing fire. All you need to say on the right-hand side here that cats and foxes are responding positively to fire. So again, if we don't take this into account, in, a, in an integrated way, we may not have the, the outcomes and, and results that we want. And again, we just mentioned Khaleesi virus before. This is some really interesting work by Reese Pedler and co colleagues showing that basically once Khaleesi virus came in, cat and fox numbers crashed. It's the primary prey, so an invasive prey species actually inflating invasive predator numbers, they crashed, and as a result, small, small mammal numbers of various species actually took off. So another really important point there. And I also just want to stress that 
native animals can exist in the presence of invasive species in some context. So this is French Island, and this is the wonderful long-nosed potteroo here. And what we found is that in areas of low, medium, high cat activity, potteroos are selecting for areas of the densest vegetation cover. So that's represented here. I won't go into that today. But basically, where you have good habitat complexity and cover, the potteroos can still make a living in the presence of feral cats. So just stressing again the importance of those other factors that we need to consider. So take-home messages. We need to protect and manage habitat complexity and cover. We need to restore ecological function, including top predators to ecosystems, manage communities and ecosystems, like I said. Consider all tools and approaches that are available to us, including lethal and non-lethal approaches. Be clear about your goals. We are often not explicit about what we're trying to achieve, what our target uh, species is, and make sure that we can actually think about the range of outcomes that might occur and can we manage those and measure those outcomes. I say measure those outcomes because often there is no money for monitoring. There's money for the doing part, but not for the monitoring part, and that's really problematic. So that ideally would be in a before, after, control, impact type design, which is the gold standard for basically measuring what, what has happened from your, from your management. And engage society, as was mentioned by Andrew, that if you don't bring this society on board with you with these issues, expect problems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ewan. I, I don't know about you and you online, I, um, I was intellectually ready to understand the problem. I'm not sure that I was emotionally ready to understand the scale of what Ewan just talked about. That is remarkable to think about, I, I, to think that there are enough native species in Australia that 2.6 billion can get eaten in one year and we still have some is extraordinary. <laughs> Like, I don't mean to be glib about that, but that is extraordinary if you think about that scale. So thank you very much. Um, uh, in, our, in our conversation this morning about impact, we're going to, take in, we're going to look at impact from a very different perspective now. Um, Gerald Leach as the, um, is, a, is a former chair of the Victorian Farmers' Federation, National Farmers' Federation, and um, many of the management committees for, for many years, actually, um, be familiar to many of you. He chaired the Mallee CMA and also is the chair of the Victorian Rabbit Action Network, which I suspect is not action for rabbits, but action against rabbits. Um, Gerald, I'd ask you to come up and... Okay, thanks, Anthony. Well, first of all, um, I, was, I was actually asked to uh, speak about our farm. I notice up there it says my farm. It's definitely our farm that I farm in conjunction with my wife. Uh, our, one of our sons and his wife and uh, his father-in-law uh, also works on the farm full time. So it's a three-person farm. Uh, both the women involved um, uh, have their own professional careers, uh, but they do have STD. If you wonder what that is, it's sexually transmitted debt, which is a common uh, uh, problem for uh, farmers' spouses. Um, the uh, in terms of the farm, uh, if you want to know where it is, it's, uh, the, it's actually transacted by the 142nd uh, meridian of longitude and the 35th parallel of latitude, so it's in the Mallee in Victoria. Um, it's, uh, uh, so it's a three-person operation. They're not wild dogs, by the way, in the back of the ute, but they would be wild if we hadn't trained them. Um, so... Um, the key figures there are 53 kilometres of single road reserve, so that's um, uh, a lot of uh, area to look after, in particularly in terms of rabbit management, but probably two kilometres of big track reserve requires uh, as much as the 53k um, of road reserve. Uh, nine kilometres of, of crown frontage uh, obviously uh, creates some issues. Uh, that's crown frontage uh, mostly with... Um, uh, the Murray Sunset National Park. Uh, our neighbours are fantastic to get on with. Uh, we have a significant area, as you can see there, of native vegetation, which again uh, creates its own problems in terms of in invasive species management. So uh, the common... Uh, not all those species are prevalent on our farm, but most of them are, as you'll see as we go, th as we go through. Uh, so rabbits are, are the thief in the landscape. Uh, we spend an enormous amount of money uh, every year to keep the farm free of rabbits. 
Uh, but uh, it doesn't matter how hard you work, there's always incursions occur, um, particularly where you've got um, land abutting uh, public land management. I have nothing, no qualm at all with the public land managers themselves, but they are underfunded, under-resourced to do the job that we want them uh, or require them as neighbours to be able to do. But we estimate that we spend 190 hours a year uh, between the three of us on, on rabbit control, so that's just, man that's just keeping rabbits off the farm. So that I would say we have no um, uh, damage to our, to our actual income from rabbits because we keep them keep them managed, but it's 190 hours a year of work as a as a minimum uh, to be able to keep that done. I just want to point out to you up in the top uh, corner there of it, you'll see a couple of uh, rabbit traps. That was the system for controlling rabbits when I first came on the farm. Um, and that was just post myxomatosis, 1966 I started on the farm, so I'm older than I look. Mm. Um, the, um, uh, and now we've progressed, of course, to much uh, more sophisticated equipment for that, for that rabbit management. Uh, foxes, uh, again, it's very hard to quantify what foxes cost us. All I can tell you is that the hunting thrill has long since left me and even my 32-year-old son has lost the thrill to go out spotlighting uh, to, to kill foxes. But uh, our est the, the estimate of what it costs us is very difficult. Um, we, we actually only lamb uh, our ewes down on the home property, so we try to concentrate uh, the lambing um, on one of the three farms so that uh, there, uh, there's less... Uh, uh, area, less extensiveness for foxes to operate in uh, and, and we have very quick lambing so that, in other words, the foxes have got to get, got to get in quickly. But there's a lot of controversy about what damage foxes do uh, to lambing ewes or, or to the lambs themselves. It's hard to quantify because uh, uh, the number of lambs that die, have they died because they were too weak to survive and therefore the fox got them or um, have, they, have they actually been hunted down and caught by the fox? What I do know in, in an experiment we, experiment we carried out on the farm is that if you get the lambs to one week of age, the foxes will not do any damage to them at all. Now, it might be five days, but we, we worked on a week. We actually penned you separately, had them lamb, then released them at seven days, and we had no losses after that. So, uh, but... Now, you do a really good job if you can get 90% lambing from ewes that are scanned with singles, and if you can get 150% of lambs from ewes that are, that are scanned with twins. So there's a lot of lamb losses somewhere. There's a real, some really good research projects there to find out what the real cause is. But those foxes on the fence won't do any more damage anyway. The biggest cost in terms of invasive species on our farm are actually mice. Uh, now, it's a, but unlike foxes and rabbits, it's not, a, it's not an every year event. Although our agronomist is telling us that uh, mice are becoming less of a, of a boom and bust problem and more of a regular occurrence. The explanation for that is more, gro more, gro more intensive cropping, more grain left on the ground. Our farm isn't intensive cropping, we crop each paddock four years, so we work on a four-year rotation, so the livestock are a very big part of the farm. But if you can read those figures there, those two paddocks alone in 2017, uh, our estimated loss from those paddocks was um, over $100,000, $109,000 I think it was. Um, and I'd say over the entire farm it would have been over $200,000. That's a fair bit of cream off the cake when you... Uh, <coughs> got to try and keep bank managers happy, which is virtually impossible. But anyway, that, that's... Uh, we're only talking about feral animals today, so I'll be very <laughs> careful. <laughs> um, the, now, feral, feral pigs and goats are a problem for us because we join public land where um, in the Murray Sunset National Park there are both uh, goats and pigs. Um, not in big numbers uh, coming onto our property. There's about 4,000 goats, we understand, in the park. We get 
uh, periodic uh, visits from them, probably flocks no more than about 40 or 50. Um, in terms of pigs, uh, my son saw a, a herd on our property the other day. He didn't have the gun um, and there were over 20 in that herd. And uh, But the big issue, if you can read, and, and Lisa Gervasoni, who put, all, put this together for me, um, uh, from the VFF, Lisa, um, she's come up with all those uh, diseases there that they can spread. So I can assure you they're a, they, they are a, a really serious biosecurity issue. And of course, they're both clave and hoofed animals. Uh, and of course, they, they also carry zoonotic diseases. So careful how you handle them. Um, the, uh, the issue of wild dogs, um, uh, we don't have wild dogs on our farm, so I'll only talk very briefly about them, but there are farmers who are on the northern edge of Wiperfeld, which is only about 40 kilometres from our property, and uh, they've had losses of up to 200 sheep a year, individual farmers on about a 100 kilometre front, so you can imagine that's the individual farm has had up to 200 uh, uh, sheep a year lost, and you can and and I think the other thing I want to say there about wild dogs is the uh, the mental impact on the farmer of finding the sheep in that sort of condition. Um, we don't have deer on our property, but uh, I've got some figures from a friend of mine, Neil Devaney, who has them on his farm near Euroa, and uh, and they uh, Neil's estimate is on a one-person operated farm, the damage is over eight thousand dollars a year. Um, I thought that cane toads, carp and feral cats weren't an issue for us. Certainly the first two aren't. Uh, we thought feral cats were only a, a problem um, to the environment until we had some late-term abortions in our autumn lambing ewes this year. And when we spoke to some veterinarians about it, they said, do you have any cats living in your haystack? And uh, was it toxoplasmosis? Uh, yeah, suddenly we got told about that, so that um, that's an issue for us. Mental. I, I want to finish on mental health. The loss of income and mental health and the issues surround it are very serious issues for farmers, and I think there's a, a really great, great research project here in that. So um, just take that diagram away in your mind. I believe there's a very strong tie-up between financial and emotional stress compliance and mental health, how they actually all inter interact and, and impact on each other. Uh, so thank you very much. Look, looking forward to uh, hearing from everyone else and um, happy to answer questions later. Cheers. Thank you so much, Gerald. And again, you know, just... Um if you multiply those numbers, if you think about the scale of farming operations in Victoria and then across the country, uh, multiply those numbers out, the economic cost just from the back of the envelope calculations there from Gerald is extraordinary again. Um, so moving to uh, an, a, another perspective, another diff very different perspective, Chelsea Cook is the South Central Conservation Officer for the Trust for Nature um, and will bring us a perspective um, from a First Peoples perspective of impact from invasive species. Over to you, Chelsea. Welcome. Hi, everyone. So before I start, I would like to acknowledge the First Nations, the, uh, the Wurundjeri people, uh, pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging, as well as First Nations who are maybe joining us today or in this room, I'd like to pay my respects to you as well. Um, this was very last minute for me, um, so I do have um, a little bit to talk about, about myself and what invasive species I've come across um, and that I know about. I'm very new in the conservation um, sector and I'm very looking forward to hearing about everyone's invasive species that they've come across and everything that everyone's going to share with us today. So thank you for having me here. I'm going to be a big learning day for myself, so I'm really, really excited. Um, so I'll start off with my name. My name is Chelsea Cook. I am an Aranda Gringy Afghan woman. I was born and raised in Alice Springs. Lived in Alice Springs for about 19 years and I moved to Victoria and I've lived in Geelong for about three years. Um, I work with the Wadarang Traditional Owner Aboriginal Corporation as a, as a um, 
completely just blurred out, so sorry. As a cultural heritage representative, I've been with them for two years and I work out on traditional land on the Wadaran land um, with traditional owners to try and find artefacts and kind of make sure that development's not going to destroy that as well as rabbits have a massive impact on that. They tend to dig up significant spots and scatter them all over the place. So we do have an issue with rabbits again. I also work with Trust for Nature as a conservation officer. I help run the course of the Cert 3 in conservation and ecosystem management. We come Within that course, we come across a lot of invasive species, more plant-based invasive species, um, but I, I can't get into that. I'll be here for days. Um, do bear with me. I am very new to public speaking and I'm trying to gain more skills in this area. Um, but with the course, we are hoping to get a lot of First Nations, Torres Strait Islanders to join. It's just an opportunity to give them a Cert 3 at the end of the course, but to also give them the opportunity to get tickets. So you get your ACARP, um, using chainsaws, and a whole bunch of other plan ID, um, and range of kind of positions. So anyone that's First Nation or Torres Strait Islander can join. Um, you don't have to have any prior knowledge or certificates or anything. You can just, just sign up and we'll do the day and teach you everything that you would like to learn. Um, so my heritage is Afghan heritage. It starts with my great-great-grandparents who came over from Afghanistan. Um, my great-great-grandmother was Indian woman who married an Afghan man. They came over as cameleers. Um, they came over with about, I think it was 20,000 camels that they brought over and they started in South Australia. Um, and they, their job was to look after the camels and work on the railway line that was from SA to Northern Territory, Alice Springs specifically. Um, so they did that for many, many years, transporting good along the way. So mail, um, construction gear, these camels could carry up to about half their body weight. So if they were six to 8,000 kgs, they could carry half that body weight um, of material on them. Um, and they used these camels because they didn't need to be watered much as a horse would. So they trialed a lot of different stuff to kind of transport stuff with horses. Horses didn't last long at all, maybe five, six days without any water. Camels lasted about 12 days without water um, and doing 200, 300 Ks in one day um, over time. So we, we've come across the issue of now feral camels in the Northern Territory. So after the the GAN railway was completed, they just let these camels go free. Um, they are now taking up about 40% of the Northern Territory and they're destroying Aboriginal sites. They're going to water holes, they're destroying all the plants around the water, they're competing with your flora and flora, um, with other, other species of animals as well. Because they do hold up so much water, they go to water holes and they hang around that and then they compete with every other kind of animal that wants to get in to kind of get off on get some water as well um, and because they travel so long distances in such a sh short amount of time they go through farming they take down fencing they then let the camel uh, the cows in the paddocks out and then you get that feral cow uh, population going around and destroying sites with them um, there's also Camels eat up to 80% of the native plants um, in the Northern Territory, which is a lot of our Aboriginal, our cultural um, foods as well. So your quandon, your sugar bush, and pearl pod wattle, and uh, supple jacks. So because they're eating 80% of our native plants, we are finding that it's difficult to find these plants and then try and keep them fenced off or keep them safe where we've done trials of fencing them off or trying to plant them somewhere else or keep them anywhere else that we could out of their reach. It's impossible. These camels are so strong and tough that they can get through pretty much any barrier. Anything taller than them, they can still get through. Um, they um, also do a lot of damage to the dunes, the sand dunes. And sand dunes are very, very 
significant to First Nations peoples. Um, so because of that damage, it's they're bringing up thousands and thousands of years of First Nations um, artifacts or significance um, burials. And it's, yeah, it's kind of just, it's heartbreaking because they're damaging a lot of our First Nation lands. Um, yeah. So with some of the managements that I've come across is I've actually just heard from Nina. Um, some people are milking them. So they're keeping them and they're milking them and kind of trying to make it in that area. Um, that's kind of a new aspect to me. I've never heard of milking a camel before. Um, so I'm not sure how that would go. But I do know that there is a lot of touristy kind of camel rides and stuff. So they're kind of keeping those numbers down. Um, they are selling it for the meat market. So they are, they are as in rangers. Um, mostly rangers are going out and collecting these camels and then selling it back over to where they actually come from um, and selling them for the meat trade as well. So, yeah. Okay. That's all I have. So thank you so much for having me. Um, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, and I'm struck by, as we, as we go through the rest of the day, um, we all know that we have... Um, a very, as Andrew talked about the first, a very complex cultural relationship with many of these species. And for that to be in one person, <laughs> the, the, essentially the co different competing cultures of, you know, the celebration of the camel and yet the not, desire not to have the camel, it's quite remarkable. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, our final speaker is Shailen um, Schofield, who is the Principal Director at the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. And I suspect that name's just changed. Has it? No, it's the latest one. It is the latest one. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Shailen. Um, and um, is working a lot in biosecurity. So I will let um, Shailen tell you. Hi everyone, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, as introduced, uh, I'm Shalyn Schofield. Uh, I work in the Environmental Biosecurity Office at uh, the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, previously Department of Agriculture, Environment and Water and Resources. Uh, look, I guess um, a lot of people have spoke already about impacts and, and uh, what, we've, um, what we're dealing with. So I, I'm coming in last, I didn't want to rejig a lot of that, um, but I do want to start by just also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet today and their con continuing connection to the land and waters of this region. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the Royal Society of Victoria and partners for putting on um, today's event. So I'd like to cover a little bit around the impact of invasive species on our native species um, and also uh, explain a little bit about our national biosecurity system. Uh, and some of the work that we're doing collaboratively with a range of our stakeholders uh, in this space. Um, so we've heard already uh, feral cats, they are responsible for up to 30 mammal extinctions. Uh, we've got um, deer, um, their grazing alone really changes our ecosystems, uh, puts a lot of pressure on a lot of environments and species, uh, and foxes have a pretty detrimental impact on our native species, but also our agricultural industries. Invasive species have established uh, in Australia, and it's come from a real variety of ways and a, and a real mix. So we've had, you know, from the first fleet and early settlers, we had cattle escape uh, and develop in terms of more feral populations. Rabbits, deer and foxes were purposely brought here in terms of sport and hunting. Um, and then we've got black rats, mice. They've colonised the world, travelling on cargo and vessels. Um, We've got a lot of invasive animals, fish and bird species are our escaped pets. You know, they're believed to have arrived in Australia from, you know, companion animals. You know, we think bringing something into this country as a companion animal because we'd like to keep it as a pet is a good thing to do and sometimes it's really not. We saw earlier, um, this is from the State of the Environment report, um, you know, it's demonstrated invasive species are having a massive impact on our environment and are one of the leading causes of our extinctions. We have 230 non-native species currently threatening, currently listed as key threatening processes affecting our threatened taxa. That's 187 plants, 41 animals and two pathogens. This figure, as you saw earlier, lists the top 10. Seven of those are our vertebrate pest animals. 
black rat, feral cattle, goats, cats, pigs, rabbits, and foxes. We also have two plants, blackberry and latana, and phytophthora, a fu plant fungus. Black rabbit, black rat, sorry, uh, impacts about 40 EPBC Act listed species. Foxes, nearly 100, and as we've heard, rabbits, 300, 330 to be more specific. Think about that, that is a lot of impact of one invasive species on our native species. We've also seen around central and northern Australia, our ecosystems, wetlands and billabongs have been threatened by our hard hoofed animals. We're looking at water buffalo, pigs and cattle, not to mention the fact that a lot of these animals, as we've heard, transmit diseases. So my focus was also on rabbits, but it has been uh, touched on before. We all know they're an enormous environment and agricultural pest species. You know, they can modify the environment to suit their own needs and that that is at the expense of many others. This causes an extreme shift in our environment, which compounds their impacts. As you can see on this map, there are very few areas in Australia where rabbits don't have a negative impact on threatened species and ecological communities. This table lists the examples of the wide ranging impacts that rabbits have. We, they threaten the night parrot by removing and modifying natural vegetation. Rabbits compete for food with many of our native species. And with their high levels of grazing and soil disturbance, this leads to an increase in nutrients where rabbits can also promote the growth of our introduced plants. Rabbits have become one of our most costly vertebrates. So I'm going to touch on quickly what we're doing to help tackle these threats. So I am partially going into the next session. Uh, but I did just want to touch on our biosecurity system. So our system that we currently have is a collaborative system working with a whole range of stakeholders to manage the risks of our pest weeds and diseases entering, emerging, establishing and spreading in Australia. There are three key parts to this system. We work on activities offshore, activities at the border, and also activities within Australia. We need to manage the movement of people and cargo in and out of our borders to help reduce the threat that those activities occur while still allowing the movement of goods and people. We have the National Biosecurity Strategy, and this was released earlier this year and is the roadmap for our Australian biosecurity system over the next 10 years. This system and our strategy help bring partnerships together across government, industry and community to protect people, the environment and the economy from our biosecurity threats. Now, while we have spoke a lot about our threats that are here already, our established threats, I would also like to draw our attention to some of the significant threats that have yet to arrive here. This list here is our exotic invasive species, not yet present in Australia, but if these species arrived and became established, they could cause significant damage to our environment, our unique native plants, animals, and our threatened species, and First Nations cultural heritage sites. This here is a national priority list of exotic, animal, exotic pest weeds and diseases. We call it the EPL for short, and it was released in 2020. It lists 168 of our pest weeds and diseases identified as posing the greatest threat to our environment and to Australia's environment. This is why we work to try and intercept what we can at the borders to stop these things from coming in. This slide here just looks at a range of initiatives that we currently have in place and is really just a, a small glimpse of what, what we're doing. And I will note while it says the role of the Australian government, it is really important that we do this all in partnership. So we've got the Chief Environmental Biosecurity Officer, currently Robin Cleland. That was a new initiative in 2018 of the importance of the environment and biosecurity. We undertake national coordination on ground management with states and territories, and we invest in research and development and extension activities. But like everyone, we are also constrained and we do have to think about where our resources are best placed and what role we want to play in that. We've worked with partners to develop a national National Wild Dog Action Plan, a National Feral Pig Action Plan, and we're currently drafting a National Feral Deer Action Plan. These take a nil tenure approach. It's the intent to maximise collaborative action across the country to reduce impacts, be it whether on environment or agriculture. 
We also have a range of invasive species that are listed as key threatening processes under the EPBC Act, and they have a, and some of which have threat abatement plans. These provide a range of research, management, and other actions necessary to reduce the threat. You're probably well aware of the threat abatement plan for predation of feral cats. Threatened Species Commissioner, Dr Fiona Fraser, also, and her support crew, look at national efforts to focus conservation, conservation efforts to help address our growing number of native plants and animals that face extinction. We also have the Threatened Species Scientific Committee who provide independent advice to the Minister for the Environment and a recently released Threatened Species Strategy, which is a forward prioritising action and investment in the efforts to help recover our threatened species. And this one here is just a little, um, uh, a brief introduction to some of the uh, research and development that we're currently involved in with a whole range of other stakeholders. Uh, and we'll get, we're gonna hear in the next session of uh, some of these particular projects uh, going forward. Thank you. We might start with a question from online. And, and do be mindful that um, while this session was about the why, all of these speakers know about the how to stop. So we can bleed the conversation into that as well. We don't have to just wallow in the devastation. So Kate, would you like to ask the first question from online? We do have a question, but it's on biodiversity control. So I wonder if you do want to save that. Please. Yep, all right. Um, Amanda Earle asks, how do the biodiversity controls align with animal sentience? Animal sentience. Okay. Biodiversity controls and animal sentience. Anyone would like to... Do we need more clarification on that? I mean, what, what does... Well, I mean, I'm happy to... Is this, I guess this is better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, animal sentience is about understanding animals as, well... Like humans, we have feelings, we have, um, you know, we, we're sentient animals. It's quite a complex definition about sentience. And I know Victoria's exploring or, you know, got draft legislation, um, a draft reform package, I think, um, open right now about uh, its change of animal welfare laws. And it does talk about, it moves towards a sentience embraced approach to how we, how we regard animals in Victoria. And I guess this is, this is a huge quandary for uh, the challenge of vertebrate pets when basically we've got introduced animals impacting on native animals and native plants. And we need to remove those introduced animals from the landscape. And it's generally impractical to do anything but kill the animals. So how do we make sure if we're killing the animals, we respect the animals' welfare, and for many people, even just their right to live. And there's often in society very mixed views about whether we should even take a life to protect the environment. And some people even regard the life of an exotic animal equally to a native animal. Now, I, my value system says I value native animals in Australia because they are unique to Australia. And I value these animals not becoming extinct and sometimes we need to do some things which may not be nice for a bigger um, benefit. So removing, killing one cat to save 10,000 seabirds that are going to be lost from an island and possibly become extinct. That is a value question, but for me, it is very important to actually, uh, you know, the, the net benefit is pretty obvious. And I, I'm, I'm happy to do that, provided we make sure there's limited suffering. So I think this, the idea of sentience is fundamental to think about when we do pest control. Maybe you and my Yeah, you would speak. I, I'd also suspect this is a topic we will come back to a couple of times today as well. But you and if you want to. Yeah, yeah, I pretty much agree with what Andrew just said. I think, you know, the concept of sentience, you know, places a lot of emphasis on an individual and, and the welfare of an individual. And I think it's important to recognise that the vast majority of conservation and wildlife managers that I know of and work with, uh, they all care about animals. Mm -hmm. Like that's why they're doing what they're doing. And I think it's important therefore that we recognize that we do have animal ethics, you know, procedures in place. And I would urge everyone to start from the position of 
do the least harm possible. And I would slightly disagree to say that we don't, that, sorry, that we always have to um, kill invasive animals to have a good outcome. I don't think that's true. But in some cases, we absolutely have to. So you are making a choice, like Andrew said, between do you let a feral cat persist and then a numbat population goes extinct? You know, that's a decision that you're making about whether you place more emphasis on an individual over a population or several individuals. So I think that there's definitely big issues to grapple with there. But I think what's most important is that whatever tools we're using are effective and the most humane that we have available. Mm. And I think if we do that, then I think the, the, you know, the case is solid, right? That's, that's the best we can do. Thank you. Uh, we will, with this, we will, this theme will come back, uh, I suspect, in the next session where there are both lethal and non-lethal control methods being discussed as well. So I think we'll come back to this theme. Does anyone in the room have a question that's not related to sentinels so that we will continue a bit that conversation? Yeah. I, I'd like to, to ask the sort of Rumsfeld style question about the things that we don't know, we don't know. And in particular, when you think about the, the potential invasive species in Australia, it's not, it's very often not the species themselves, but their parasites that are amazingly important in, the, in that issue. And the question is really how, do, how much do we know about the potential parasites of a lot of these species which we're trying to keep out? Who would like to have a go first at that direct question? But then I want each of you, actually, I'm going to come back to you. After we've had the parasite conversation, I want to come back to each of you and ask you, from your perspectives, what do you feel we don't know enough about? But who wants to tackle the parasite directly? Um, I can start. Yep. Um, so, look, I'll be honest and say there's a lot we don't know about things that aren't already in the country, which is why we do as best we can, a considerable amount of work with other countries uh, and also developing up, as I explained in my presentation, um, more informative lists of what are the key threats out there of, of particular things that we do want to deal with. And when I, when I look at those threat lists, they have a range of, you know, you've got funguses, you've got pathogens, you've got um, a whole range of diseases as well as the animal themselves as well as um, you know the things that they can potentially harbour so we do do all of that you know serious consideration but the reality is things change all the time um, trade pathways are changing all the time um, and it's really hard to predict all of those things so um, we do we definitely work hard intelligence is a very important part of it as well um, but there is a multitude of different species and animals uh, and diseases in the world and, and we just do our best to try and work out what are our biggest threats that we do want to know more about. Do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I'll just add to that that I think it, it's a brilliant question because we need more parasitologists for starters <laughs> and we need more people working in wildlife mm -hmm. disease. So I think wildlife disease and, and the impact of parasites is often dismissed as, as a big factor for the declines of many species, including many of our mammals, and purely because we are data poor. Uh, so, but I think even things like toxoplasmosis, it's quite variable, the impact that it has. So in some cases, it can be devastating for populations, depending on the environmental conditions, in other cases, not. So I think, again, it's, it's, it's really hard to generalise about some of these issues that we're discussing about you know, the impact of parasites versus the direct impact of predation. Uh, the fact of the matter is in some cases it's going to be both. So I think, but yeah, I think Andrew touched on resourcing and funding. You know, this is a, a massive limitation in so many ways, whether it's just the, the, the on-ground work or whether it's funding, you know, mm. wildlife, um, health people, parasitologists and so forth that can actually help answer some of these questions. I suspect too also, just as a, a, an aside, as I, I let you all think about what you're going to answer for the Rumsfeld question um, that I'm throwing to you next, um, I suspect we as a society know a hell of a lot more about the origins of some pathogens given what happened with COVID. Mm. Suddenly zoonotic diseases are, oh wow, these things come out of species and habitat destruction, etc. Um, so uh, let's work this way around the table. So starting with you, Gerald. So Donald Rumsfeld had that wonderful, you know, the, the unknown knowns and the known knowns. And so what is it from your perspective that's the, the unknowns that you'd like to... Uh, yeah, well, I'd like to take you back to that last slide of mine. Thanks. Um, and, and that's the mental health impact um, on, on farmers 
uh, of invasive species um, because uh, I think that's an area where there's a lot that we don't know, um, don't understand. Um, the, uh, as I, I don't know whether you're trying to get up there, you're not, no, that's right. Um, because um, it's all very well to talk about the sentience of animals and I'm, and I'm not going to get into an argument about that, but uh, we really have to look at, I believe, not just the financial impact on, on our farmers of invasive species, but also the mental health impact mm. on them. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a vicious circle in a sense. Mm. Um, we don't know whether people who are non-compliant in some aspects of their responsibility to control or manage uh, invasive species, uh, whether they're being impacted uh, by financial stress uh, that may be then impacting on their ability to be compliant. Uh, and so that's why I talk about it as a vicious circle. Mm. Um, so it, it's a real uh, unknown, or sorry, uh, to me it's a known <laughs> unknown. Yeah. Um, and I won't get into the unknown unknown. <laughs> okay. uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, th I, I, I mean, I keep thinking there's a, there's a, there's a huge uh, research opportunity out there yeah. for someone uh, to, look, to see what those impacts are and then what can be done about them. Thank you. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's likely we won't be able to pick up many unknown unknowns because they're, by definition, hard to know. Um, but, Chelsea, what would, from your perspective, um, what would you like to add around just, you know, what in your, it, from what the perspective that you brought, is a kind of an unknown that you think we should be spending more time on? Yeah, look, I'm really still quite new to this aspect, so I'm still learning myself. Um, and... Finding the unknowns unknowns is really hard because there's not that many researchers out and the research is not there. Um, we don't have enough people that are looking into it and being able to get that data out and give it to us. So, yeah, for me, it's just having to do a lot more research on my side of things and trying to find routes of who to go to and who can help me um, figure those out as well. Mm. So, yeah, that's probably my aspect. I don't know too much into it. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I'm, I'm still learning myself. Yeah. I got a massive unknown out of your talk, which was how, and it builds on this conversation about the values clash, how, how do we rec reconcile different cultural connections that people have um, to different species? Um, that, 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 that to me seems to be, and maybe it's just maybe that seems yeah, to be a bit like of an super unknown. it's conflicting because the camels have been a ca ca like part of the family mm. camelias. Mm. Um, you looked at these camels and you praised them and, you know, it was such a proud moment because your people have worked so hard to get where they got and then all of a sudden they've become a massive invasive yep. species and they're just destroying your land and your cultural significance and there's stories and dream timing about camels and how they, you know, were walking across the desert with with the camels like loaded up with water and stuff and so it is it's conflicting because you grew up with dream time stories about the camels and how your family went around and did that and now you're selling them for a meat trade or you're milking them or yep. yeah there's try, trying to find ways of keeping them out of our sacred areas to preserve what we have yeah. from them destroying it yeah Ewan Unknowns. Now, now I know asking a professor for a list of unknowns, this could take... You've only got a couple of minutes, all right? Because <laughs> um, I know it's your day job. <laughs> I think one of the biggest challenges is knowing the power of which lever a manager can pull and which is likely to be effective. So we know for some invasive species, we actually have quite effective tools that work relatively well a lot of the time. For others, it's far more challenging. And so as an example, you know, targeting feral cats is really difficult. Uh, at scale, at landscape scale. Um, but potentially, if we could manage grazing pressure better, fire regimes better, and various other things better, could we have more uh, native species persisting in those landscapes, even in the presence of those animals, those in introduced animals? So I think that still remains a really big question. And again, something that I think that doesn't get the attention that it deserves, that Invasive species are a massive problem. There's no, there's no argument about that. But the changes that have happened to habitat caused by us have really made that, that problem much bigger than in some cases it might otherwise be. You know, 
cats are just predators like quolls are predators but they're capitalizing in some areas that are really beneficial for them now they're open they're less complex so they can really run run you know run right you know on top of wildlife populations so i think understanding the various importance of different levers and how tractable they are and how likely they're to be effective still remains a really big challenge and unknown in many cases. Thank you. Sean? Unknown, you can be Rumsfeld for that. <laughs> so I'm going to come at a slightly different angle here uh, and I'm going to say that there is a lot of great work that is currently occurring in this space that I don't think is as appreciated and as well publicised as, as we know. And I think there is a bit of an unknown there in the broader community about what is occurring and what, I guess, a whole range of stakeholders and community groups can achieve in coming together to tackle these threats. And so I see one of our unknowns is actually stealing one of Andrew's points, which is um, that we have the opportunity to take forward a really great movement in doing this more collaboratively together. And that, for me, is an unknown that I think is is something we can all all fix without having to pour a significant amount into it. It's just better understanding what we're all collaboratively doing right now. It's such an interesting insight because the you know all, all the 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 movements take off when they're really broad based, and you know if just sit, looking at this table, this is a very broad based set of um, different perspectives and different sectors, and 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 as a movement, the start of a movement, it, it it's a you've. I guess the little pieces of the movement are there. Um, Andrew, um, if you were Donald Rumsfeld, um, your known unknown or your unknown unknown. Well, I love the exciting but unknown possibility of uh, ambition and, and, and trying new things. So that's, that's, that's an exciting unknown that I think we all need to step into, step into the unknown to do exciting things and do things you don't, don't normally do. It's just, uh, it's just uh, I guess, a bit of an inspiration for us to all go beyond our com comfort zones. But in the world of invasive species, the unknowns are what's going to come to Australia and which, which are our next pest species. With vertebrate pests, we're largely regulating the, the pathway, if you like, but we haven't completely done it. So it just takes um, a tourist who has left their shoes outside a resort in Indonesia for an Asian black spine toad to hop into them. They chuck it in their luggage, come home, put it out on the porch, and out hops a black spine, Asian black spine toad that has 20,000 eggs in it. Um, and then suddenly we got a new outbreak of a cool climate-loving cane toad. So they're the unknowns. And the list that Shailen put up about the number of threatened species that are impacted um, right now, the 1,200 or so threatened species, 80% of our threatened species are impacted. That's for the species that are already here, not the ones that aren't, are still to arrive. So we've got plenty of unknowns. And then we've also got the issue, you know, we're here now because we're learning, so we're trying to improve our knowledge, and, and, and so we've got less unknowns. So as scientific research is all about addressing the unknowns. And uh, most of the research in environmental bios in invasive species is focused on agricultural invasive species. That's where the funding is, so that's where most of the scientists are. So there are huge unknowns in the environmental space, invasive species. And that sort of lens comes back to the funding question, well, why? Because we're not funding it, we're focused on agricultural threats and that comes back to unknowns about we don't even know the impacts. We only just, if you look, go back 20 years to the State Environment Report when I first started coming out, invasive species weren't even recognised as a big impact. So we now have knowns, and we're now starting to spend funding. But then an organisation like the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions, which does some environmental research, but a lot of agricultural research, their funding stops in June and falls off a cliff. So we don't have long-term funding, and therefore we won't have scientists to fill in all the unknowns on really important environmental questions. So we've got huge unknowns, that's why we're here, and that's why we have scientists to fill in the blanks. So Keep doing your good work. <laughs> Thank you. Now we, we've got time for. I'm going to take one more question from within. Oh, is there a? Okay, maybe we'll take. Is there a broadish one, Cat, online? Uh, okay, great. We'll take an interesting broad one from online, and in the room, you'll get the first one next time. 
Brayden asks, uh, because, you know, we have five people up here and we're going to have lots of speakers today with so many organisations and groups with kind of as a slightly different goal or focus, um, but you've all got, you know, this big picture problem, invasive species. Uh, do you believe that there's enough coordination and communication between you all to actually, you know, make some real headway in the fight against invasive species? Brilliant question. Who would like to tackle that initially? I'll start by saying probably the answer is no. Is there enough coordination and communication? Um, and I think, you know, the new biosecurity strategy nationally says we need more coordination, communication and collaboration because most people don't ever know what the word biosecurity means. We, we're starting to understand what invasive species mean and we're starting to understand what the impacts are. So it comes back to those unknowns again, doesn't it? And um, so we just need to do a lot more. Gerald, you, you look like you want to add to that? Yeah, so um, I'm fascinated when you uh, when we hear a question like that, and here we are facing the demise of the uh, Centre for Invasive Species Solutions, who are so good at coordinating. Uh, so it beats me. We just we just seem to knock knock ourselves back every time. So again, that's another yes. We need more coordination. To... Okay, you in? Um, I was going to say, yeah, pretty much the similar thing, but I think uh, to add to that, what is, I guess, um, troubling is we're missing opportunities to learn. So, you know, managers are doing terrific work on ground, as an example, controlling pest animals and so forth. If we were better um, engaged and linked in with each other, there's opportunities there to actually approach that in a more experimental yeah, way yeah. and actually ask questions that we want answers for. Um, and we're missing a lot of opportunities there. So again, if there was better alignment, better um, engagement between all of us, uh, there's much more opportunity to learn and, and help solve some of these issues as well. So we're missing those opportunities. It's a really, I was thinking of a very concrete example when you were talking, Gerald, about the, um, you, you know, the, the boundary between a park estate and a farm area and the management practice either side of that, what could be learned from just exchange of, of, of techniques um, between those two groups would be interesting in itself.